Southern Westboro um, at Whittier Rehabilitation Center. Um, my practice is mostly, when I was at UMass Medical Center, I, uh, I did some trauma, trauma orthopedic, orth, orthopedic surgery, which I didn't like doing. Uh, it's one of the reasons I left UMass. Um, and then um, since I've been at New England Baptist Hospital, I do mostly just uh, treat hips and knees. Um, I do some knee arthroscopy, but the biggest procedure I do is hip and knee replacements. I do probably around close to 700 hip and knee replacements a year. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. So two a day on average, three a day sometimes? Uh, days I operate, I usually, I usually do five a day. I do a fair amount of redo hip and knee replacements, which take a little bit longer. So if I don't have a redo on a day, I usually do five. First time hip or knee replacements. If I have a redo, it's usually the three or four, depending on how long the surgical case will be. Great, great. So today's, you know, the topic of what we're going to talk about today, Jim, is, is obviously hip pain in general. And mm -hmm. then, you know, sciatica and how sciatica can kind of convolute hip pain and kind of knee pain too. Um, mm -hmm. So let's just dive right in. So, you know, I think a lot of patients, especially when they come into my office, they've got, you know, hip OA, they've got, you know, typically some concomitant sciatica, you know, and the question that I always get is, when is it time to get a cortisone shot? When is it time to go see Dr. Neris? When do I need to go get surgery or get this looked at? So my first question to you is, I guess, who is the perfect candidate? If you were going to operate on that perfect, you know, 60 year old, healthy male, female, who is that perfect candidate for a total, here, total knee or total hip? You know, I think, um, you know, I would say that the, just for arthritis in general, I always tell patients is um, the wearing away of cartilage. And once you have it in the joint, any joints, including the hip and the knee, it, it um, continues to progress with time. So um, I, I think no matter what joint you have arthritis in, um, you should, you know, try and put off, you know, hip and knee replacements as long as you can. Um, um, and then, uh, there are several modalities that you can try to, you know, to help you kind of buy some time before you need a hip or knee replacement. And those include um, anti-inflammatory medications um, like, you know, ibuprofen, Aleve, Celebrex, those types of things. Um, uh, they can be cortisone shots, um, uh, which are, um, are for for knees. You can inject a cortisone shot just in, in anybody's office uh, for hips cortisone shots have to be put in under x-ray, so they usually have to be ordered and done up at a hospital. Um, physical therapy or exercise is another uh, thing that can um, that can help. And so all those things, what I tell patients is all those things help your symptoms to a degree. They don't um, stop the progression of the arthritis. They certainly don't, you know, grow the cartilage back or anything like that. Um, and then, so most people would start with those things. And then as far as who's the best candidate for a hip and who hip replacement, who's the best candidate for a knee replacement, they're both very different. Um, so from a recovery standpoint, hip replacements are a lot easier to recover from. Um, knee replacements are a very difficult recovery. And also from a functional standpoint, um, hip replacements, once you've recovered from them, are have very few restrictions, if any. Um, and then knee replacements have a fair amount, have some restrictions afterwards. And so because hip replacements have an easier recovery and also um, uh, are more functional afterwards, we don't try and you know have patients wait to the very last minute to have hip replacements. Whereas knee replacements, you do kind of encourage, especially younger patients, to um, to put them off as long as they can. Now, can you tell our listeners, you know, for knees specifically, you know, because we get a lot of active older adults, you know, former athletes golfers, tennis, right? So in tennis specifically, that's a big one, right? So you got to be able to cut, run, accelerate, decelerate. Um, do you feel like somebody can play tennis after a total knee? Like what are some of the activities that will a total knee will, will really limit later in life? Yeah. So the, the biggest limitations with knee replacements are that um, as opposed to a hip replacement where a hip replacement, once you have it in, you don't even know you have a hip replacement. Um, knee replacements, you know, every day that you have a knee replacement, it's not your normal knee. And the, the way they feel different is that the first thing is the um, because it's metal on plastic and your anterior cruciate ligament comes out as part of a total knee replacement. Um, they have there's they pop and click, so they have a mechanical feel to them. Um, and then because your anterior cruciate ligament is not part of the a total knee replacement, it's like having a a, a knee that doesn't have an anterior cruciate ligament. So when an athlete tears their anterior cruciate ligament. 
um, they usually have to have it reconstructed to, you know, participate in sports the way they were before. But with knee replacements, the first thing you do when you do a knee replacement is you cut the anterior ligament out. And uh, there have been multiple attempts with with um, total knee replacements to keep the anterior ligament, and they've all failed. And um, so, so because of that, running or jumping does not feel normal. But certain activities where you don't have to do a lot of runner jumping, um, and I would include, I would say the two big ones are tennis and uh, skiing. Um, those, I tell people, you know, if you, if you modify the way you do it, including tennis, including skiing, it's fine to do with the knee replacement. Um, it just feels a little bit different. Um, so with tennis, um, I think doubles tennis is probably better than singles tennis. And even singles tennis is okay if you're not trying to play it in a very competitive way and then with skiing you know you're not you know doing like the black diamond skiing i don't suggest snowboarding with with a knee replacement um but um just you know regular um you know easy skiing is fine with it yeah will you have them wear like a, a bledsoe brace or some sort of fancier brace if they're doing a higher no, end of no they they um and it, and it takes it takes a little bit of time to get um you know the you know, the, the way that it's going to feel doing those things. And, um, but people ski fine with them. It's just that you have to ski a little bit differently and, um, there's stability with them. The, the bigger problem with skiing is falling, um, you know, rather than the actual, you know, skiing itself. Yeah. Do you ever see like periarticular fractures if, if, you know, somebody falls at the total knee? Yeah, they have, they can frequently fracture above the, the femoral component, that's where they usually fracture. You don't see it a lot, but you definitely do. It usually takes a trauma, um, some type of trauma to do it. But um, um, yeah, it's unfortunately something we do see after knee replacement sometimes. Yeah, so, and I know we're talking about hip and, and sciatica, but I've seen a fair share of hemi, hemi-total knees recently. And during that hemi-knee operation, do you do, first of all, do you do them? And second of all, are they keeping the ACL and the hemi? Yeah, so that's the big difference. So. I do do partials. I don't do as many as I used to. Um, and part of the reason is because um, I do a lot of redos and I, even when I was doing them, I was redoing more partials to converting them to totals and I was actually doing partials. But so the one, one big advantage to a partial is that you do keep your anterior ligament. So your knee feels a little bit more like a normal knee than a, than a total knee replacement. So it's, it's also, even though it's a hard recovery also, it's a little bit easier than the, than the total knee replacement. Um, the problem with partials is that the um, everyone, because of the anterior ligament part of it, um, and it's a little less of a surgery. Everyone wants that to be their, you know, what what they need. But essentially, there's three compartments to the knee: there's medial, lateral, and underneath the kneecap. In order to be a good candidate for a partial knee replacement, you really need to have arthritis in only one of the three compartments. Usually, the medial compartment, the inner part of the knee. But what usually happens is that people have more severe arthritis in one compartment, like the inner part of the knee, the medial compartment, but then they have some arthritis under the kneecap or in the other compartment. And as I mentioned to you before, arthritis is a chronic progressive disease. It continues to progress with time. So even if somebody had just a little bit of arthritis under their kneecap or on the outer part of the knee and you do a partial and they feel good for a year or two, sometimes they, after even a year or two, sometimes they'll start getting pain on the front of the knee, on the outside of their knee as that arthritis is progressing. And then all of a sudden you have, you know, a painful knee again. And, uh, and then, you know, you end up having to have a redo of that partial to a total. And so if you look at, there's a great study, um, the Australian, we, we in this country don't do a great job of um, keeping a joint replacement registry where, you know, every patient that has a joint replacement, you follow them to see, you know, how they're doing them. Other countries do a lot better job than we do. And uh, so one of them is Australia. So the Australian registry followed partial knee replacements out five years. And at five years afterwards, 20% of them were already converted to a total knee replacement. So that means that those 20% of people probably should not have gotten the partial um, because they're probably not good candidates, but either the surgeon kind of pushed it or the patient really wanted to push it. So, so you just have to be really careful with partials and, and just have arthritis in just one part of the knee, which is not that common. Yeah, I mean, you know, and just from my clinical experience, seeing those hemis, they never do as well, you know, and it's, you're, you're pointing to one, one thing or another, but, you know, a lot of times they're in runners, right, and the runners, obviously, they have the patellofemoral 
uh, you know, and de deterioration under, under their kneecaps in that second compartment, along with the medial deterioration too. Right. And it's, mm -hmm. you, know, you wonder, I've probably seen maybe 10 over the past year, and it's just the outcomes aren't even close to what they are with the total. But the whole conversation is trying to put that total off. And then that's right. one of the... Um, right. That's one of the well, I think, to be honest with you, I think when they're a good candidate um, for a partial, which you don't see that frequently, um, I think they do do very well, but you get a lot of people. Um, yeah, I probably, I, I probably do eight or nine redos of partials to totals every year. Um, whereas I only do probably three or four partials myself um, a year, oh. and uh, and it used to be more. And then once I started redoing a couple of my own because people still had pain, then it became kind of personal, and that's why I'm I'm very strict on the criteria right now. So. And give us an idea of how many total knees you'll do in a year. Um, I usually do about 400 total knees, total knee replacements a year. So 1% is a hemi. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, that's what a lot of people is, but there, there are some, there are some orthopedic surgeons, including in the, in the Boston area um, that kind of want to kind of get their niche and be known for like one specific thing. And um so there's a few guys that really push partials and, um, and, um, and I'm sure a lot of the, you know, I'm biased because the patients that are coming to me with a partial that, you know, I didn't do are coming because they're still painful. Um, where, so, you know, you do see a fair amount of people that still have issues with it. And some of them will say, okay, you know, I don't want to, I still don't want to have my total converted to total near pushing. I'll just tolerate this for a period of time. But other people said, no, I want to, I want a painless knee. And so, you know, they'll jump into it. But um, I'd, I would just be really careful with the whole partial knee replacement concept because of that. Yeah, no, that's great. That's good advice. Um, let's talk about the hip. So cemented, uncemented, you know, is that still like, are you still having these conversations? Has the technology advanced? What, what's, uh, what do you, where are you guiding patients with, with that conversation? Yeah, so total hip replacements have come, had gotten to the point where pretty much um, the gold standard is uncemented, no cement, and they do much better. When when you have an uncemented implant, you have a surface on the implant that the bone grows into eventually. And pretty much technology has gotten so good at this point where as long as the bone grows into the prosthesis, it never uh, it never ungrows. The bearing surface, the the ball rubbing on the, the the on the plastic can wear out over time, but even that takes a really long time. Um, so now the only issue is that when you when you un, when you don't use cement in a hip replacement, um, you rely on getting a very tight fit of the implants to the bone, and in doing so, especially if somebody does not have great bone, you can get fractures around the implants, and um, and even when you put them in, and sometimes you don't notice it when you put them in, and so because of that, actually cement is making a little bit of a comeback with hip replacements, most, just mainly in older patients that that don't have good bone. Okay. And that's just to make sure that there's not any of that the fracturing around. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's talk about, you know, kind of age wise for a total, a total hip. Would you go, you know, I've seen patients at 40 years old, get bilateral hip replacements. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, in some, a lot of the hockey players, obviously they, they start with labral tears, the goalies, especially, you know, you see them all the time, I'm sure, you know, and then they say, okay, Sean, when did like, when is it time? You know, my hips are killing me. When do I go need to see Dr. Jim and just get this done? So what is your kind of starting period? And then what's your, your late, like who's, how old is too old? Yeah. So for hip replacements, really, um, and I always compare, I keep, apologize. We're, we're still, we keep trying to talk about hips, but I go back to knees, but um, so knee replacements, we cut people off at, at some point because the recovery is so hard. And once people start getting into their late eighties, the recovery just isn't worth um, what it puts the, the, the patient through at that point. Hip replacements will do people even into their 90s. And then also, I don't even hesitate now to do somebody in their 20s um, with a hip replacement. You, know, you do have to tell them that, um, you know, in order to do that, that they, um, you know, that they have to take care of the hip replacement afterwards. Um, it will wear out on them at some point, even though they do really well nowadays. Um, but, you know, in the older days, there, was, there were these really major procedures for younger patients called osteotomies to yeah, try and yeah. reshape the hip um, to buy you some time before hip replacement. Those are very rarely done nowadays because hip replacements do well even in as young as their 20s. But you know, if, if somebody 
is going to get their hip replaced in their 20s, they certainly should have bone on bone arthritis and they should have tried some conservative things already. Um, but, um, but, you know, a knee replacement if somebody came in in their 20s, in 30s, and sometimes even in the 40s, I would tell them, don't do it. Um, but hip replacements, I don't. Yeah, that's great. You know, and it's, that's contrary to what I've, what I've been told, what I've heard in, in the past, you know, we've always heard, you know, as PTs, you know, just try to continue to push, try to continue to get them out of pain. And maybe that's yeah. of what we're taught, you know, at least at Northeastern in, in our programs, you know, and, and what we do as, a, as an occupation, try to, you know, prevent surgery, prevent, you know, you know, injection yeah. sort of thing. But, you know, I see injections as an adjunct to what we do. Um, yeah. you know, and I also see the pro, you know, proper surgeries as an adjunct to, to what we do too, to getting the outcomes that we need. Um, yep. let's talk real quick about, um, approaches, right? So there's a couple things that I want to talk about, but you know, we, I, I didn't send this, this over to you in a question, but you know, you were talking about a 20 year old athlete, you know, hockey player, potentially RA, you know, what about those with like severe FAI, you know, you've got, we used to be seeing these, these fancy surgeries at a hospital for special surgery 10, 15 years ago, they were doing labor repairs all the time. I don't yeah. see too many of those anymore. Is that something you would consider or? Well, so that was something that gained popularity about this, this concept of impingement, femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, where you have essentially bone spurs around the hip that impinge that can hit on the labrum and cause labrum tears. But so there was a big push um, and you hit the nail on the head with, um, there, there are two surgeons, Mark Philippon out in Colorado and then um, uh, Brian Kelly at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, really kind of, tried, you know, to say, that's probably, I would say, 11, 12 years ago that you could arthroscopically take off some of the bone spurs and fix the labrum and do, you know, do fairly well with it and, and still be able to participate even in, you know, professional athletics at a, you know, at a high level. Uh, the problem is that there are, there are now multiple studies that show that if you have even moderate arthritis with femoral seven pins and syndrome, hip arthroscopy does not do very well in that person. And a perfect example is uh, Alex Rodriguez. So A-Rod, um, Brian Kelly at HSS um, scoped both of his hips and um, earlier, before he retired, one of his hips did well. Um, you know, I didn't take care of him, but my understanding is that that one had minimal arthritis in when he had it done. And then when he, he had one done the year um, he retired, didn't do very well with that one. And then Actually, um, my understanding also was he was kind of blaming Brian Kelly for it, but you know I guarantee you it's because that hip had you know moderate arthritis in it, and um, and they just that doesn't do very well in that setting. So um, so I, I think there's a there's a um, there is a place for arthroscopic hip surgery and impingement syndrome, but you just have to be careful, kind of like the partial knee replacement um, um, argument. Yeah. And so in those 20 year old athletes or 30 year olds, um, you know, when you do that total hip replacement, they can go back to, you know, after six months of rehab, they should be able to go back to playing hockey, anything and be good to go. So there are, it's interesting. So there are some professional athletes that, that have had hip replacements that have gone back and played. The most famous one is Bo Jackson. So, but Bo Jackson only lasted about a year and a half and he's already had a revision, but that, that was, uh, Bo Jackson's my age. He's, um, he was a senior in college when I was. Um, so He's 52 now, and I know he's already had one revision of his hip replacement, but when he had his hip replacement orig originally, the technology was not as good as it is right now. There are some professional baseball players and one hockey player that um, have had hip replacements that have played afterwards, but not for very long. So I don't think a hip replacement allows you to play at a level of a professional athlete, but it allows, it allows you to play, um, you know, you know, at, you know, pick up you know, certain things. What I tell every patient after they're completely recovered from hip replacement, the only restriction I'll put on you is that you should not do repetitive high impact activities. And what I mean by that is that you shouldn't run every day. You shouldn't train for a marathon or run a marathon. Um, um, but if you want to occasionally run, run on the treadmill, um, I, you know, or run outside occasionally, I think that's fine. But, um, you know, I wouldn't try you're running a, a 5k with it or even or something like that but and if you but if you want to play some pickup basketball periodically too i think it's fine with that too but getting back to that you know professional level of of something it, it's not for that yeah probably just because the the general demands right you have to keep your body in you know in a high level of, 
Well, yeah. Maybe not for the baseball players, but a pretty high level of shape, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, because I know there was a famous, the, the Red Sox first baseman in the early 2000s, he had AVN bilaterally um, in his hips. And remember that there, there's been some guys that you can look at professional athletes and you can tell whose careers were ruined by hip arthritis, like Mike Wool. Um, the third baseman for the Red Sox, he had his hip scope and never came back after that. So he obviously had arthritis. Tim Thomas, the Tim Thomas, the goalie for the Bruins, he had a hip scope and never really came back after us. He obviously had arthritis. Isaiah Thomas for the um, for the Celtics, um, he had a hip scope. Uh, actually, he didn't have a hip scope um, initially. I think because it was thought by some people that there's too much arthritis, and then he ended up having his hip scope by Brian Kelly at HSS, and he's not he's not playing right now. He he wants to play right now, but it's just he's never gotten back to that same level. But once you get arthritis, it's it's like I said, it's going to progress with time. With the hip replacement, I always tell people the difference between the hip replacement and the replacement recovery wise is that two weeks after a hip replacement, almost all patients will say, "Wow, I wish I had this done sooner." But two weeks after a knee replacement, almost every patient says, well, I wish I would have waited a little longer. <laughs> yeah, well, well, they're in the back room screaming while I'm bending yeah. 110 degrees. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because I see your op report and you say, Sean, I got him to 120 in the operating room and I'm yeah. breaking on him. The yeah. towel in the mouth, you know, but uh, <laughs> you know, that's interesting. So let's just talk about two, you know, we'll get to the sciatica piece and how that kind of convolutes the hip, you know, people don't really understand the difference a lot of times, um, you know, especially when there's referred lumbar radiculopathy or there's, you know, that can kind of, you know, pain at, um, you know, Fortin's area, that sort of thing. Um, but let's just talk about when you go into that joint capsule, right? And so that's when, it, when I think about the younger athletes in particular, even at like 40, 50, you go into that joint capsule and that capsule is so tight, right? There's a lot of pressure in that capsule. So when you're replacing that, you know, the, the joint, um, is that sort of like, I feel like, is that, in, is that why a lot of people obviously can't, you know, it's gotta be the reason why a lot of people can't get back to the level that they were at because you're infarcting that. Can you talk to that a little bit? Um, I think more of it is, um, I think more of it is muscular after, um, after hip replacement, but, um, you know, the capsule contracts as you get worse and worse arthritis. And that's why when people have arthritis, they lose flexion and internal rotation. Um, I'll tell you the one thing, oh, the other, th the, you're starting to talk about the hip, the hip spine syndrome thing, but there's this thing called hip spine syndrome where a lot of patients that have bad arthritis in their hip start having back problems. Um, and one of the reasons is because when you, as opposed to knee arthritis, where when you put weight on a bone on bone knee, you just have pain every, every step you take when you walk. With hip arthritis, there's, um, there's ways patients are able to kind of walk, limp, uh, finagle their body away in a way that it makes their hip not hurt that bad. But in doing that, a lot of times it throws their back off and then they start getting some sciatica pain or whatever that's pain in their butt that they think is from their hip, but it's actually probably coming from their back because it's throwing their back off a little bit. But um, the um, uh, as far as when a lot of patients will try and kind of put the hip replacement off themselves just because they don't want a big surgery. And the big thing that a lot of times brings them in to have the replacement is once it gets to the point where they're having a hard time tying their shoes, putting their socks on, cutting their toenails basically. And, and because hip arthritis, as it gets worse, you lose hip flexion. That happens at some point, especially when it's somebody's significant other or their spouse is having to put their socks on in the morning or tie their shoes or whatever. People just say, I've had enough. And, uh, and, and, and that's a lot of times what uh, brings it. But a lot of times it's too late. And, uh, you know, because by then, sometimes it has thrown off your back. And um, from a hip replacement standpoint, it doesn't change the outcome by, by waiting too long. But in some people, their, their backs, their, their spines can get so bad and they can have some sciatica that doesn't go away with just having the hip replacement. Yeah, I think that's a great point because obviously if you can't bend at the hips, you're using your back to bend. Exactly. You're picking yeah. something up off the ground. Um, so that's a really important point. Uh, let's talk about the straw that breaks the camel, camel's back. So you mentioned, you know, they can't, they can't tie their socks or they can't put on their socks, can't tie their shoes. What are yeah. some other common things that people are coming into you saying, you know, Dr. Neris, I can't, you know, I just can't play sports or like, what is the most common thing that you hear just other than pain that yeah. people can't do because of their hips? So I always tell you, a lot of people have a hard time deciding when they're at the point where they need their hip or knee replaced. And, um, and I always tell them there's a saying in orthopedics, orthopedics that you'll know when it's time. And some patients will say, I don't know what that means. And you say, well, you don't know it's time yet because there reaches a point 
in somebody's life, um, especially it's, it's a harder with knee replacements because people talk to other patients have had knee replacements and they all will say it's really hard recovery. There are some limitations, but, um, but there reaches a point where you just say, look, I've had enough. And, um, and, and usually what I think that time frame is, is that when it gets to the point where you, every time, every morning you wake up, you're planning your day around how you think your hip or your knee is going to feel with certain activities. Um, that's usually gotten to the, you know, to that point, um, you know, especially I think with near poison, super poison, I, you know, I'm, I'm not encouraging everyone with, you know, just mild to moderate arthritis to get a hip replacement, but, um, you know, it, I don't, I don't think with hip replacement, you have to wait till the very, the very end. I certainly wouldn't wait, um, you know, past when it's starting to affect your back, um, or other things. Yeah, that's great. You know, and that's a huge, that'll be a big change in, in my practice. Cause I've always tried to tell patients to put both off, you know, until they're in severe, you know, until they're seven out of 10 pain. So that's, I think that's really good for people to hear. Yeah, and they yeah. should, they should have a fair amount of pain, but I just like near point, especially in younger people, you really try to push younger patients off from, from a near, near placement standpoint, especially if you can to get into their fifties, at least. Um, but hip replacements, um, you know, you, you should have significant pain. I, I agree with you. You should have you know, six, seven, you know, uh, you know, out of a 10 point scale pain. Um, but, you know, once they reach that point, um, you know, it's, I think it's very reasonable to do and not really put it off at that point. So. Mm-hmm. Now, who do you feel like, you know, obviously you write prescriptions for PT all the time. Who do you feel like uh, is a good benefit? Like number one, do you write prescriptions for prehab before a total hypertonia? And number two, who do you feel like is a good candidate to, you know, have success with physical therapy? Yeah. Um, knee replacements, definitely. So there are multiple studies that show that the range of motion you get after a knee replacement is directly proportional to the range of motion you have going into it. So if you have somebody that has already lost a fair amount of their range of motion from their arthritis, I send a lot of those patients and I encourage pretty much every one of them to do prehab, you know, uh, trying to get some of the range of motion back before surgery. Um, hip replacements, um, again, I just, I'm not as picky about, um, picking who to do with, uh, you know, a hip replacement on. So I don't send a lot of the hip replacements to, to prehab. Um, but, um, if they, if they certainly, if they, if they want to, to get, get some of their muscle, you know, mass back prior to the hip replacement to make the recovery a little shorter, um, afterwards, and then we'll do it. Now you mentioned, did, were you doing RIF to the hip too? You were doing trauma? Yeah. 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 How do you feel like those do compared to the total hips? Well, more commonly, those are on more debilitated patients. Um, you know, there's some of the um, some of the fixation devices for fixing hip fractures also violate some of the muscles a little bit more than total hip replacements do actually too. So it, it kind of depends on the type of hip fracture. Um, femoral neck fractures, um, uh, we've now kind of come a long way with orthopedics where you can make an argument when somebody has a femoral neck fracture, displaced femoral neck fracture, that you just do a total hip replacement right off the bat, even though they don't have arthritis versus trying to fix the fracture and then having some complications related to it, like a vascular necrosis down the road where they might have to go undergo a second operation again. So there's more, there's more and more of a push in orthopedics with displaced, displaced femoral neck fractures to just go ahead and do a total hip replacement right off the bat. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, and so just for the general audience, so an RIF is a, is typically a procedure that's done, um, you know, I would say emergently, right after a fracture. You'd say Ur- urgently, yeah, yeah. urgently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, usually we see, at least in my setting, I see the RIFs. You know, after an older person has a fall, they break a hip. It could be they had a total hip and they they fell and they broke around that area. You know, periarticular fracture. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, so when we talk about rehab, we talk about, um, you know, total hip replacements, that sort of thing. I think it's, when I look at an ORAF, I always, I always look at that as an opportunity. Could we have seen that person beforehand, you know, and it prevented some of that, you know, prevented the fall, which is the cause of that, the trauma, you know, and I think that's the big thing. When I see a 70 plus year old who's walking with an intelligent gait or, you know, Trendelenburg sign. And I'm saying, okay, or, you know, and their gait is clearly, you know, they've got hip pain. I want, my job is to prevent that fall. You know, it, my job is to prevent them from getting to your office in the first place. Yeah. Um, but obviously if they've got severe arthritis, the call needs to go into you and say, okay, let's screen and let's work together to make sure this person is getting the help that they need, but that the glute meat and glute max aren't completely, you know, 
continuing to atrophy over time, which they do anyways, right. to try to prevent that fall because those stats are just awful. I mean, you break a hip, your mortality rate, you know, goes sky high within a year. Um, yeah. So I think that's a really, you know, that's a, a kind of a scary stat. You, you know, so, and that's tied immediately to balance, right? Single leg stance time, all that good stuff. But um, exactly. Let's talk, about, let's talk about approaches. So lateral approach, anterior approach, posterior. What do you what do you like and what do you prefer? Yeah, so there's a big controversy now. So there's a lot of marketing to a newer direct anterior approach to the hip. Um, and, you know, I'm a little bit, I'm, I would say I'm very biased actually, but um, so um, because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there, but um, the direct lateral approach to the hip, in my opinion, um, you know, is not a, not a great approach to the hip right now, because with that approach, you take off at least one third of the gluteus medius and gluteus minimus muscle or tendon, and you repair it at the end, but studies have shown, and I've certainly seen it, that a lot of times it pulls off and some people can have some permanent weakness around it. So the, the advantage to the, that direct lateral approach, or some people call it the anterior lateral approach before in the past was that the dislocation rate of that approach compared to the posterior approach was less. Um, not a lot less, but a little bit less. Um, but with the direct anterior approach, you don't touch the abductors, the um, gluteus medius and gluteus minimus uh, muscles or tendons. Um, and so the, the, I would say the one slightly advantage, although there's some studies now that are showing that, um, that the dislocation risk between the posterior and anterior approach is similar, um, the, the posterior approach probably has a slightly higher risk of dislocation afterwards. Um, but um, with the direct anterior approach, there are multiple studies that compare now the direct anterior approach to the posterior approach. And you can make very easy conclusions about what those studies show. And um, the problem is that when people, there's a lot of people that market or advocate for the anterior approach um, because it's somewhat a newer approach. People that are um, you know, sooner out of their training are doing more of that approach to kind of try and market that against, you know, say some of the, a little bit of an older approach, like the mini posture approach that I do. Um, but there might be a slight, if you look at studies, there might be a slightly faster recovery with the anterior approach, direct anterior approach versus the posture approach by a few weeks at the most. Yeah. But, and this has been shown in multiple studies, there's a higher complication rate with the anterior approach. Um, so, and it's various complications, and some of them are permanent complications, including nerve nerve palsies. Um, there's also a nerve that goes very close to where the direct anterior approach to the hip is, called the lateral femoral nerve, which gives um, a fair amount of patients with the direct anterior approach numbness, permanent numbness on the front of their thigh, the front toward the outside of their thigh. Um, which people that do the direct anterior -approach, approach will even probably tell you that they don't even consider that a complication, but there's also a higher incidence of fracturing the femur, putting the, doing the direct anterior approach. There's also a higher complication of the femur never growing into bone and needing another surgery. So the way I tell patients is that the reason I haven't switched to the direct anterior approach is, um, yeah, I don't want to sound arrogant, but um, I don't, I, I'm busy enough and I don't, I don't have to do it to try and get, you know, business or, or patients. And then um, there's also several studies that show that there's a learning curve that say the first 150, 200 direct anterior approaches that you do after you switch, there's a really high complication rate. And for me to put my patients through that when I've been very happy with my results with the, with the mini poster approach, I don't think it's worth it. And then the other way I tell patients to look at it is that if you have the direct anterior approach and you don't have a complication, you're better off compared to the posture approach, maybe by a few weeks of recovery. But if you have one of the complications, um, many of them require more surgery, um, a lot of them through the posture approach. Um, and also some are like nerve palsies or things that don't get better. And, um, and so to me, it's not worth it. That's my personal opinion. There's other people that uh, feel differently, but um, you know, the American, the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons has come out with a statement regarding it um, because there's so much what some people feel is misleading marketing where people that do the anterior approach will say only the good thing about it, that it's a less invasive approach, which I also don't agree with uh, compared to the posture approach, um, or it's a faster recovery, but they won't tell patients that there's a higher complication rate. And when I do redo hip replacements of people that have had the complications from the anterior approach, 
when I tell that to patients all the time, they get very angry and they say, I was not told that having the direct anterior approach had a higher incidence of this. And I say, well, you know, it's, you know, it's, it, you know, it is what it is. Obviously it's, 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 it's done now, but, um, um, but the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons says that the surgeons should tell patients the pros and cons, but at the same time, surgeons should do the approach that they're most trained in. Um, they should not be switching around approaches, what they would say, but I totally agree with that. Yeah, I think, you know, and, you know, and on the back end, you know, me seeing, you know, the lateral approaches, posterior approaches, there really isn't too much of a difference, you know, on the rehab side, other than the fact that the lateral approaches typically have less precautions. Um, yeah. But it is really concerning to me to hear that, you know, the glute meat and the glute men are, you know, really affected in those approaches because those are your primary balance muscles. You know, those yeah. are really your single well, leg well, the posture approach doesn't touch the gluteus medius or minimus. So the posture approach does not take any of the muscles off. So there, there are no muscles that are taken off or sacrificed in the posture approach that's not also sacrificed in the direct anterior approaches. The only muscles that come off are the short external rotator muscles, and those are the ones that are attached to the ball of the hip, which has to come out whether you're doing it through the front or the back. Um, right. So um, that's why functionally there have been multiple studies that show that um, at three months after hip replacement, whether you had the direct anterior approach versus the posterior approach, if you didn't have a complication with either one of them, patients are equal. But there will be, have been more patients that have had a complication with the direct anterior approach. Yeah, and it's it's also tough. It's easier to see, you know, and I've always I've seen more posterior approaches than I have the anterior approaches. But you know, it's even working in brain injury rehab, you know, seeing them immediately almost post op and some of the ones that are more complicated. The fact that you can't bridge can be really really frustrating because that's how people get out of bed. You know, that's how people move around. You know, and that's really one of the big, you know, it's the, one of the frustrating parts of that anterior approach um, when they first come out post op. Um, yeah, that's really yeah. kind of a. Kind of an interesting yeah. Point, but. yeah, don't get me wrong. I, you know, if a, if a surgeon has always done the direct anterior approach, um, and that's the one they're most comfortable with, that's the one that they should do. And and um, but they should also tell the patients the pros and cons of the, uh, of of each approach. And um, and same thing for me. Um, and that's why since the anterior approach has been out, it does, you know it does uh, have me spend an extra five or 10 minutes a lot of times with patients with hip replacements going over the difference between the two approaches. Yeah. And I think most patients nowadays, especially, you know, in 2021 with the access to technology and reviews and everything, they're shopping different, you know, doctors all the time. They want to see yeah. okay, who's the best doing the total hip. Okay. This guy's newer. He's you know graduated from here, whatever he's doing this cool new technique but you've been doing this forever. You've been doing a great job at it. And that's, you know, people want to hear, I think people just want to be confident in their surgeon that they're going to get a great outcome, you know? And I yeah. think that's really important. Agreed. Um, yeah. Let's just touch on quickly before I let you go and, and let maybe give people a second to ask questions, snapping hip. And then let's just touch on like trochanteric bursitis. Um, are you doing cortisone shots in the office for a trochanteric bursitis or? Like we do. You- um, I think, I think both those things are, interrelated. So um, I think a lot of trochanteric bursitis comes from a tight IT band that's, that rubs over the greater trochanter bursa. And that's what snapping IT band syndrome is too, where the IT band snaps over the greater trochanter, which is the prominence. When you push in on the side of the hip, the prominent bone right there is your greater trochanter. But there's a bursa sac right there and there's an IT band that's tight in some people right over the top of it. And so I think the number one um, thing to do for both a, a tight IT band, which can be causing bursitis or a snapping IT band syndrome is IT band stretching exercises. And, um, mm-hmm. and you know, doing them consistently every day for, for you know, several weeks is the only way it goes away. Um, sometimes if people have a lot of pain doing a cortisone shot, you know, prior to, you know, them undergoing physical therapy for those, uh, for those conditions can sometimes help. Um, but if patients aren't having a tremendous amount of pain with it, just doing those stretching exercises first, um, you know, is, is um, you know, I think is, is probably the best way to go. Hip replacements, you just have to be really careful. If they get choked or bursitis or tight at T-band after that, I encourage my patients to just have me do the injection just because it has to be done very sterily because the hip replacement is very close to it. And, uh, you know, if somebody just wipes the skin with a little alcohol pad or something, does a steroid injection, happens to get a little bacteria down there, it's a disaster. So that's your outcome. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. uh, you know, so it's so I do dry needling, you know, trigger point dry needling here. And I feel like yeah. since the IT band is just such a thin layer of connective tissue, I feel like 
and it doesn't have all the properties of muscle, right? So it's just kind of, a, yeah. you know, just the thick connective tissue. It does respond really well to, to dry needling to lengthen that tissue. Yeah. I find that stretching can just be a pain in the butt of <laughs> that tissue. And the same thing with foam rolling. A lot of people yeah. just crossing their legs. It's like a weird stretch to do, but yeah. I do find that soft tissue work and, and dry needling helps with the IT band. Um, yeah. But I know in particular, you know, I, I, if people are still having trouble with that, the, really that hot tender pain right on the outside of their torcanter, I'm, I'm sending them right to you and saying, okay, we need that cortisone shot or just look at them and see what you think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the patients get this um, um, false um, feeling that you can take out the trochanteric bursa. And it's a, that's an operation we almost never do because um, because it's more the IT band, tight IT band over it. So if you go in and take out the, the trochanteric bursa, and you still have the tight IT band there, the bursa, the bursa just forms again, the bursitis just forms again, and you just have the surgery for not, you know, for nothing. So, so it's, when you get that, it's really something that it's, it's, it's a non-operative problem, basically. Yeah. Just fix the root cause, you know, which is the yes. tight, tenacious, you know, IT. Yep. Um, what haven't we covered? I, th- I feel like we talked about a lot, you know, I think the the low back, you know, can, can play a role, you know, it's vice versa, right? So I think that hip back syndrome, you know, if somebody's got a bad back, you know, sometimes they're stooping, you know, they're limping a little bit more, that can affect it. Um, yeah. You know, you can change the gait. Can you talk about, you know, sometimes some instances where you see, you're, maybe you're expecting to see a severe arthritis in a hip. <laughs> it's just nasty L4, L5 or L5 S1. Well, I think what happened, there's a lot of patients that feel that any hip pain is from their, from their hip. And so, butt pain is almost never from hip arthritis. And um, so when people have butt pain, it's most likely from their back. And even if they have severe arthritis in their hip, that's from their back and probably waiting too long to have their hip replacement. And so you have to, you know, tell those patients, look, uh, because they'll talk to their neighbor who had just groin pain and not the hip spine syndrome, who, you know, after four weeks had no pain after hip replacement. And, um, you know, and they'll come in at four weeks because they have butt pain beforehand from sciatica. They'll come in in four weeks and say, "Look, I feel better, but why is my why is my butt still hurt?" And you say, "Remember, I, <laughs> I said, you know, that's not from your hip; it's from your back." And uh, yeah. hopefully, indirectly, that'll go go away with with time, but it doesn't always. And so, but that in general, hip arthritis causes pain in the groin, front of the thigh, um, sometimes on the side of the hip, um, but never in the butt. Yeah, and it's interesting too. We we have two therapists that are uh, certified in women's health here. And I feel like a lot of those symptoms can also shoot to the hip. Is there anything you see? Do you ever send uh, patients of yours to see it, like a women's health PT or a women's health? That or sometimes if somebody has groin pain and they don't have much arthritis in their hip, it sometimes can be a labrum tear. And, and those people you send for an MRI arthrogram of their hip. But, um, but sometimes there are other things like a hernia. Um, so I'll send some patients to a general surgeon to make sure they don't have a hernia sometimes. Um, but very frequently when patients start getting hip arthritis, they feel that they have either a hernia or a, or a muscle, a groin pull, because that's where the pain is. And they don't, they just don't associate that with the typical location that they would expect from hip arthritis. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of times not until they start losing their motion or not being able to bend over the waist that they then start thinking something else is going on. And that's when they get an x-ray a lot of times and see that it's actually their hip. And then they come in to see us, you do a quick, th- you know, you do a thorough exam, but you find out that, you know, there isn't pain with, str- you know, strength into the adductor group, but there's yeah. a little bit of motion, you know, you confirm via x-ray. I yeah. think that's really good. I think that's really important uh, for people to know, Jim, is that, you know, if I do have groin pain too, it could be, and maybe it's not just that I, you know, woke, woke up the wrong way. It's, you know, it could be a sign of, um, you know, advancing hip away, uh, especially, yeah. you know, if you're 60 plus, 55 plus. Exactly. Um, Anything yep. else you, you want to talk about? I, I want to get you back to uh, to patient care here. No, that's all right. Um, no, I um, I think you covered. I, th- I think you're very thorough in uh, in covering all these things. Yeah. So um, yeah, and I think hip replacements and knee replacements are both very successful operations. And and um, and you know, it just you just I just feel that patients do the best um, when they kind of know the facts and, and, uh, have, and have realistic expectations, both with the recovery and, and with the, with the limitations. Excellent. No, that's great. And so my last piece always is, is if people want to reach out to you or they want to connect with you, where can they find you? How can they get in touch with you? Uh, so my, so you can always get in touch. You can just call the main number at New England Baptist hospital, but the best I work, my, um, 
I'm part of Longwood Orthopedic Associates, and um, my number, my uh, office number is 617-277-1205. And again, I have an office in Westboro for kind of more central Massachusetts patients. And then, um, and then I also have an office, my main office is in Chestnut Hill, um, on Route 9 in Chestnut Hill. And then I operate at Newman Baptist Hospital. I also operate at a surgery center up in Nashua. And that's actually another thing that um, we didn't touch on, but um, it's becoming more common that patients go home the same day with their surgery. It's becoming even much more common since the, the pandemic has hit um, to kind of limit patients' exposure to, to COVID. So like I did, I did a near person already this morning up in Nashua that um, um, the woman's probably on her way home right now. So that's, that's all, like, you know, can, can just tell her, like, so what did that used to be three years ago? It used to be 24 Even, hours? Yeah, two or three nights in the hospital usually. So now it's hip replacement, all, every hip replacement can go, pretty much can go home the next day, but a lot of them, it's, e it's easy to go home the same day too. Um, and the, um, you know, knee replacements, um, have more pain after surgery, but actually the the way we do nerve, the way the anesthesiologists do nerve blocks nowadays, and, and some of the things we inject into the knee, there's the the pain isn't bad the same day. Unfortunately, those things wear off the next day. Um, but you can make the argument that you know when you're you know it's easier to go home that same day of surgery because it doesn't hurt as much as going home the next day. And then when you're at home, um, you know you have the pain medication there and and um, and then in that setting, we rely on the physical therapist more, you know, um, to be because they're not starting off the physical therapy in the hospital. They're obviously starting off the physical therapy at home. But yeah. some some patients, a lot of patients like that um, to be in their own home doing it. So, yeah. So how soon do they start PT after uh, your operations if they're going home the same day? So like the woman I did this morning um, uh, up in Nashua, she um, she will have done physical therapy at the, at the um, center before she left, and then they'll have out, they'll have a home physical therapy set up for them to come in the very next day. And then they usually come in three times a week, and then the patient um, um, does therapy on their own in between that. And it's the same thing for hip replacements. Yeah, I think you know, and you, I'm sure you encourage people to get probably out of the home out of the home as soon as possible to get to a, a facility. I mean, we've got anti gravity, you know, treadmills. We get yeah, it's just much so, better. Yeah, the, 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 sooner you, the sooner you get to outpatient therapy, the better. Yeah. The only issue is that um, patients can't drive usually after hip or knee replacement. So I, I let patients drive with the hip replacement for their left hip when they're off crutches. It's usually two or three weeks. Um, for the right hip, I make them wait four weeks. And then for knee replacements, it's about three and a half weeks. And so, um, but as long as they have a ride to, um, to, uh, to be able to go to outpatient therapy, um, it's, it's better. So we encourage them to go as, as soon as they can. Now, have you sent or prescribed any any of your patients uh, who are avid runners, maybe, and had a total hip replacement? Have you had any experience? We just got the Alter G, like the anti gravity technology, so it gets, you know, have you had any experience with that or sent? You know, I, not that specifically, but we've had a, we, we've seen, and, and I know they have one here, a Whittier too, but um, a lot of places are getting these. Um, they're doing the anti gravity running. You know, it's it's not a pool, but it's in like it's almost like a tank of water, basically that they they do it at. And so, um, you know, I've, I've seen that before. Mm -hmm. You feel like there are benefits, or you know, I, I think that probably the I'm not sure if I, I haven't even read too many studies yet. We just got it last week, but uh, you know, in terms of how it might accelerate rehab, I think there's I think there's a lot of advantage. At least as far as getting in the water, just from their incision standpoint, they can't do it at least for four weeks. Usually, sometimes six weeks. So. So that ends up being something that you have to do right. a little bit later on, just um, you know, from an infection standpoint for the from the incisions. But um, no, I think there's I think there's a lot of um, you know um, advantages to that. And then weight bearing wise, you touched there immediately after surgery. Weight bearing is tolerated. So both hip and ear, both hip and ear replacements are usually weight bearing is tolerated. Um, at least that's what I do. Um, and um, if you get a fracture, putting the implants on. Yeah, so uncut, but um, yeah, so almost all minor weight bringers tolerated. That's great. Yeah, and so just for the audience, that means you can put as much weight down as you can handle on that hip. So you know, you with with, crutch, to use, with you know, crutches or a walker initially. Yeah. yeah so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but the PT will help. You know, the home PT should help you wean off of that. Exactly. Which would be great. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jim. I appreciate you joining me today, and uh, thanks for taking the time. And, I have to, uh, I, if anyone has questions, I have time for questions if you want to. It's, it's up to you guys. Let's see. Let's see. We've got Kim Hampton here. Kim, do you have any questions?
question. Uh, let's see. Just give them a minute to ask. Let's see if there's anything on Facebook here. So we're going live on uh, Zoom and Facebook here, Jim. So you're uh, you're going to be famous oh, this afternoon. <laughs> I don't even, I don't even have, my kids make fun of me. I don't even have Facebook. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I was trying to figure out how to use it. I could <laughs> like running <laughs> test webinars this morning, texting you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. It's funny. Uh, you know, this is, you may not be able to touch on this, but I did get a, a question this morning from, um, from one of our patients, constipation and its relation to hip or sciatic pain. Are you seeing any correlation correlate between that? Um, yeah, I, I think when people get bad hip arthritis, they a lot of times frequently will get sciatica um, with it. And, and um, I also find problems with patients that have sciatica that end up having a knee replacement. A lot of times the recovery um, of a knee replacement, especially the first four weeks, because there's so much straining with therapy, can sometimes make the sciatica worse initially. And um, a lot of people that have sciatica, I'll send them for a epidural steroid injection, you know, a couple weeks before their knee replacement, just to help them out with that. Now, if you know somebody needs to have, you know, they've got a bad back and a bad hip, hip meaning they've got severe arthritis, uh, or spondylosis, you know, they've got, um, you know, some severe injury at both levels. Will you work with a, a back surgeon hand in hand to figure out that person's care? Yeah. And when I was at UMass Medical Center, one of my, two, two of my best friends there were spine surgeons. We shared a lot of patients, um, with each other in general, because back surgery is not always an exact science. Um, most of the time they'll tell you to, if somebody has severe arthritis in their hip, go have the hip replacement first and see how that, if that helps your back or not. And, um, but uh, except if somebody are, is having neurologic symptoms in their legs, then, then you probably want to uh, um, uh, address the back first. Yeah. You know, at least from a therapy perspective and it's, you know, I feel like every other month in our, in our journals, the JOSPT, it's talking about how, you know, the outcomes of a, you know, laminectomy versus PT in five years are almost exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, we're really trying to get people to push off those, you know, un, you know, obviously unless there's severe nerve involvement, severe pain, really yeah. trying to get people to push off back surgeries. But I think that's a great point. You know, if people do have concomitant hip pain and, you know, maybe the arthritis isn't, you know, maybe it's not 90% got to go maybe it's 50 percent, but that 50 percent yeah. is causing that debilitating pain you know i yeah. think you do the hip and then you just say okay let's see where we're at you know I think exactly. that's a great point totally agree uh, yeah. that's wonderful the back you know the back gets tough i really try to tell people to push off as much as you can um especially with the stenosis you know because there are a lot of things that we can do in pt to help loosen things up uh so that you know people aren't getting the symptoms you know hitting kind of just trying to hit that root cause of getting everything above and below moving. Yeah. And the same thing with the hip too. I mean, if you're not getting hip flexion or inter internal rotation, your back is, I mean, it's really, right. you know, it's, it's going to be in tough shape because you're not going to be able to bend or twist or play, you know, play golf. Right. You're not going to be able to do anything. So the exactly. hip is usually the first thing. Somebody has back pain. I might not even treat their back for a week and I'll get them in yeah. three times. I'm working on their hip, their calves, their knee. And they're like, yeah. you know, are you ever going to work on my back? I said, I'm working yeah. on your back. You just don't get it yet. And then exactly. in three weeks, they say, thanks, you know, but um, yeah, yeah, I think we really touched on a lot. Let me just see. There is one question. S1 nerve impingement. Can you recover without surgery? Yeah, that's um, S1 nerve impingement typically gives you pain in your butt down the back of your leg, sometimes to the bottom of your foot. Um, and yeah, a lot of that, um, just like, as you mentioned, um, a lot of times conservative treatment, I actually have that. I had an L5S1 hernia disc, me personally, myself, and I was getting tired of it. I was still able to operate, but it was, it was uncomfortable. And um, I got to the point where I was going to have surgery. I, and I went to the surgeon and said, you know, if you're still operating, why not just put it off? And uh, still, and he encouraged me not to do it. And it did go away eventually. Um, so a lot of times with that, it depends on how bad it is, um, um, how bad the nerve root impingement is. But a lot of times conservative things like therapy, sometimes like an epidural or selective nerve root injection, um, um, anti-inflammatory medications, you know, stretching exercises, a lot of times that can um, go away with that. I know the one thing that I did a lot of with mine was this thing's called, called McKenzie exercises. And I still do that, those sometimes um, now when I feel my back acting up a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, and a question personally for you is, you know, when you're doing operations, I know you're six foot eight, six foot seven, uh, six, 10, 
six ten. Yes. You must you must have special equipment, right? So you must have at the table, you know, because uh, when you think of what you're doing all day, you're stooping, you know, yeah. which is that perfect angle to have creep at the you know at the lumbar spine. So yeah, I'm used to it. Yeah, a lot of people have to stand on a lot of people have to stand on stools uh, <laughs> when I operate. So yeah, it, it, it is what it is. So probably have separate, separate health insurance policies, right? Because they get a, they're all <laughs> bending over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they love it. That's great. No, so you know, I think that's really you know, and for you too. I mean, if you're stooping over patients all day long, you know, same thing we see with dental hygienists, dentists, uh, hairdressers, yeah. right? You're constantly yeah. flexed. Days, you know, so uh, yeah, keep up with those McKenzie extensions. You know, yeah. I don't want you. I don't want you to have to see me, Jim. We don't want that. <laughs> uh, good stuff. So let's just see. Okay, uh, we got one more question. Gabapentin. Are you ever prescribing that for uh, you know hip pain, low back pain? Is it, yeah, when it's when it's nerve pain? when it's nerve pain a lot. I actually prescribe it a lot when after knee replacements when people do get that sciatica that gets worse. Um, in that like first four weeks after a knee replacement from the therapy, I, I prescribe gabapentin very frequently in that setting. Um, but for, for sciatica, you know, with, with hip pain, I'll prescribe it too. Everyone wants, of, uh, every, everyone wants Lyrica because um, there's fewer side effects than gabapentin, but almost no insurance company will cover Lyrica unless you've tried gabapentin first. Interesting. Uh, and then I know there's been a big push against nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories post-surgical because, you know, I guess they're affecting healing and things like that. What's your take I, on that? We put, I put every patient on Celebrex for four weeks afterwards. I think it helps. Um, for hips, it helps the bone spurs not reform after hip replacement. There's something called heterotopic ossification, which is essentially bone spurs um, that can cause stiffness in the hip afterwards, and it helps prevent that. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. I know um, we had Ben Savvy at a podiatrist on who does podiatric surgeon, he was saying, you know, he's just completely away from the inset. So it's, a, you know, it's an interesting take. And I'm sure to each body part, there are different considerations. Yeah, probably. So that's, that's good. You know, and also the push against opiates, right? So I'm sure you're trying, you know, as much as possible not to prescribe exactly. opiate analgesics. Um, exactly. <laughs> because of the pandemic, you know. Um, are you really prescribing any opiates anymore? Or is it kind of... No, no, you do. Like Especially, even hip replacements need them for a short period of time afterwards. Knee replacements need them more frequently, but we're getting patients off of them quicker than we normally used to, you know, even five or six years ago, there were a lot of patients that would be on the opiates to some degree for three months. That almost never happens anymore. Now, most people are off them in three or four weeks. That's great. That's great. Um, and then just one last question in terms of total length, just give people an idea of how long they're looking at for a total hip. Uh, Total hip replacements mostly completely. I always tell people with total hip replacements that by four weeks, there's really not any, there's not much pain at all in four weeks, but there's still some stiffness and there's still some weakness. And that takes 12, 12 weeks from the time of surgery to work itself out. So people are pretty much totally recovered from hip replacement um, three months. Knee replacements take a year to completely recover, but they're 90% recovered at three months. But that last 10% takes over the course of a year, it kind of takes a year to work the kinks out of a knee replacement. That's great. And then precautions for total hip. I do. So I do dislocation precautions because I do a mini poster approach for four weeks afterwards. Um, okay. And then um, most people that do the people that do the enter approach usually don't do precautions at all. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, I think we touched on everything, Jim. I, you know, I don't know if there's, if there's much we didn't great. touch on, but no, you know, thanks so much. Uh, this, you know, Dr. Dr. Jim Naris, uh, expert orthopedic surgeon at uh, New England Baptist hospital. Thanks so much for joining us. And, uh, Really appreciate your time, Jim. My, okay. my pleasure. Let's play Good. some golf this uh, this spring. What do you say? We should definitely. <laughs> All right. Good. We'll get out soon. All right. All right. All right.